of the Amazon basin lies the jungle city of Pucallpa. People live here much like people anywhere. Working, playing, creating families. The children here are much like children anywhere. Noisy, energetic, full of new life, except for those who are different. The hundreds born each year with facial deformities. Because of the isolated nature of this region, doctors and medical facilities simply are not available to treat these unfortunate children. They and their families stay tucked away, out of sight, in a distant corner of the Amazon forest. But all that is about to change. 3,000 miles away in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Dr. Larry Sargent, one of the world's leading plastic surgeons, is about to embark on a journey. A journey measured not only in miles, but in the range of the human heart. A journey to bring help where there is no help. A journey to help these lost faces in the forest. Not too long ago, Pukaupa was a sleepy jungle town on the Akayali River, 300 miles northeast of Lima. Clearing of the surrounding rainforest created a boom in the lumber industry. People streamed in from remote farms and villages, lured by the promise of a better life. For most families, the promise was empty. The reality is far more grim. In Pucallpa, poverty is a fact of life. No one knows for certain why there seems to be so many children born with facial deformities in this region. Is it genetic? Or is it from the severe toll industry is having on the environment? Or could it merely be a cruel twist of nature? For the majority of the people, there would be absolutely no hope if Dr. Sargent didn't come. They could never make the money that they would need to make a trip to Lima, where they could be operated on, but would never be able to pay the bill. And they would have absolutely no hope no matter how hard they worked or how hard they tried. There would be no hope. Raul Kio knows that only too well. His wife abandoned him when their son, Walter, was born with a facial deformity. It was very hard because the boy misses mother a lot. I couldn't work because he missed me too. Whenever I would go out to the field, he would follow me, but the sun was very hot, so I would take the little fellow home and try to go back to work. He would start crying, so I stay and bathe him. At night, I put him to bed, and when he went to sleep, I would sneak back out to the fields to work the soil. Today, Walter is 12. I hope the American doctors will operate on me so my friends won't tease me anymore, so I won't have to fight with them. Victoria Estrada is also fighting. Her struggle started the day her daughter, Christina, was born, when local doctors urged her to let her baby die. The lady who was helping the doctor said to me, why should you have a baby that is sick? Pray to God, pray for him to take her away. If she lives, how will you take care of her? 
How will you get the money to have them operate on her? Those operations are expensive. Pray for him to take the baby back. Local doctors have told Domitia Galvez and her husband the same thing. 11-month-old Angelo is slowly starving to death because of his deformity. At the hospital, the doctors have given up on him many times. They tell me he's going to die now. There was a time when he was so skinny. They would say, your baby is not going to live. He will die in a few days. But I took care of him however I could. These families and many others like them have had little reason for hope until now. We chose Peru to help the children uh, because they really can't help themselves. Uh, and, I, and I feel very sad when I see a child with a deformity and I, I have the desire to try to correct that. And, and it's like I'm trying to give every child the chance to have a normal face. Dr. Larry Sargent is professor and chairman of the Department of Plastic Surgery at the University of Tennessee. His specialty is craniofacial surgery, amazing procedures where the patient's face is peeled back and the bones beneath reshaped, literally sculpting the skull and creating the foundation for a new face. Dr. Sargent has emerged as a primary force in the field, pioneering groundbreaking technology that continues to define this new science. The results are remarkable. But craniofacial surgery requires more than technical expertise. Above all, the surgeon must be an artist, able to look at a damaged face, visualize what it could become, and mold that vision into being using precision tools and the hands of a sculptor. In a few days, Dr. Sargent, along with a select team of surgical specialists, will travel to the Amazon basin donating their time and skill to perform this amazing surgery and to offer the children of Pucalpa a second chance. I think it's a chance for us to give back something, to make somebody else's life a little bit better and happier and give them a chance to have a normal life. And that wouldn't happen otherwise if we didn't do it. Attention, attention. Un equipo de cirujanos norteamericanos. Dr. Sargent's coming is announced both on radio and TV and by word of mouth by people who are interested in any kind of surgery and who have hope that somebody's going to come to operate on whatever need they have. small towns and villages across the region, families begin the long trek to Pucalpa. When they hear that Dr. Sargent is coming, they make every effort to get here. They will come, some from Lima, they come from river villages, in dugout canoes, from outlying districts along the lakefront, from thatched roof houses. They come by taxi in town and they come walking and they will walk through rain and mud and whatever to get to the hospital. By the time the American doctors arrive at the hospital, the waiting area is already filled to capacity. Some have walked days to get here. Inside the examination room, team members begin their evaluations. Uh, 
Dr. Sargent will examine dozens of children over the next eight hours. I would say that we're probably going to operate anywhere between 25 to 30 children this trip. We're trying to do about four to five cases per day. How old is he? However, some of the children we're doing two procedures on, so it's like getting two operations at once. Far more families have arrived than the team expected. Some children may be turned away. That's always very, uh, a lot of tension in it. It's very difficult to do because you don't like to turn away anybody and you would like to help everybody, but uh, there are a limited number of operations that we can do in a five day period. Doctors are forced to move the less severe cases to the end of the line. There are a lot of frustrations. Things are a lot different. Um, the language barrier is a real problem, uh, trying to communicate. It's real frustrating when you want to share your heart with people and, and, and you can't. Many wear their best clothes, hoping the doctors will notice them. I'm waiting to see if they will operate on me so I can look better. I hope they will, and that the operation comes out well so I can be happy. I saw some other boys here, like my son. I feel good. Because maybe his problem is not so bad. Maybe easier to fix than I thought. I hope they will operate on him. We're evaluating him to put him in categories. Yeah. Kids that are, uh, have unrepaired cleft lips and palates, uh, those are the ones that we're trying to do first. The ones that have secondary deformities but have already had something done, then we will try to do those if we have time. And then there's a category that we might not be able to do them if they're too severe. He's uh, 16 pounds, 11 months old. Late in the afternoon, there's a meeting to decide which cases the doctors can operate on. We sat down and just categorized each one and, and arranged the day for the week. I think that we probably could do these two procedures at once. Uh, he needs a palate repair, and then he needs a repair of the midline cleft to the lip. Here, she's, uh, I think that uh, this is a pretty severe deformity. Outside, the families begin the long wait for the doctor's decision. I had to say nothing to some people, which means no, and then make a lot of other people happy. Yeah. Okay. Escucha bien, por favor. Escucha bien. Día lunes, a las siete en la mañana, van a estar acá Angelo Macias Galvez, Joel San Ganosa. Okay. Y Erika Ruiz Mozambite. Okay. Walter Tangoa Hurtado. ¿Está acá Walter? ¿Está acá? Okay. Walter entiende. A las 7 de la mañana vas a estar acá. Jonathan Guillén Torres. Okay. 
Cristina Lizón de Estrada, a las 7 de la mañana sin comer nada. I'm so happy that my son is going to be normal. His friends won't pick on him anymore. They won't insult him and make fun of him. We saw a lot of kids that can really benefit from these operations that we're doing. And we're providing something that they can't get in this country. And if we can give uh, some of these kids an opportunity to live a normal life, then this trip has been more than successful. But it's now clear the task these doctors have in front of them state-of-the-art surgery in facilities that are dangerously outdated. Dr. Sargent still believes he's made the right decision. After all, these are faces that have always known disappointment. For the first time, something new is in their eyes. Hope. Monday morning. The first day of surgery. Angelo Galvez is the first patient. I pray to God that everything will be okay. My son is in the doctor's hands. I pray that everything will be good for my little baby. We'll have to get another light or something here. Damn. How does this raise up? Angelo, like Christina and Walter, all have cleft lips. Christina and Angelo have the added complication of a cleft palate. The roofs of their mouths are split down the middle. That makes it very hard for them to eat. Dr. Sargent and his team have corrected these problems many times before. They are routine procedures, but little Angelo is their first patient in these strange surroundings. Part of the challenges you just see working in a uh, unfamiliar environment the things that you're used to are not available, so it's a matter of preparation. Once you get over here, if you don't have the item, there's nowhere to go and buy it. So a lot of preparation goes into this. What we're doing right now is freeing up the floor of the nose. I need a floor of When all goes as planned, doctors can repair a child's face in as little as two hours. But here in Pucalpa, they are working with outdated equipment that's often poorly maintained. So far, everything's going real well. What no one can possibly realize is that during the next 12 hours, these conditions will push the team to its limits. In the waiting area, where people have been gathering since before sunrise, it's 110 degrees. <laughs> Walter has developed a fever. Equipment in the operating room is about to create a much larger problem. The machine that is delivering the general anesthetic to Angelo is malfunctioning. He's getting far more than he needs, but the gauges don't indicate any problem. The team has no way of realizing what's happening. We've already got the nostrils rotated in, and uh, we brought the Flip together, and we've got a good full vermilion here. Now we're just putting the final stitches in the filtral columns. Outside, Walter's temperature is climbing. It's made worse by the plastic bags on his feet. Everyone in the clinic is required to wear them to keep germs from spreading. So everything went real well. Uh, these stitches that we're putting in now will stay about four to five days and they will need to be taken out. But Angelo is taking longer than normal to regain consciousness. So I'm certain that our vaporizer here, because this, uh, the maintenance that's, that's, or lack of maintenance that's done, probably delivers about twice the uh, concentration as, as, it's, uh, as you think it is. So uh, Angelo's doing fine. He's just taking uh, longer to wake up because he was deeply anesthetized for the procedure. Outside, 
Angelo's father is growing concerned. Every area to wake up a little bit more and then he'll be ready to go. Even though he is taking far longer than normal to wake up, the decision is made to continue with the next operation. There are six children scheduled for surgery on the team's first day and they can't afford to fall behind. Dr. Sargent must complete three more procedures before it's Christina's turn. The first day is always the toughest, but after we've done a few cases, I think all the kinks will be worked out. And we won't be using this, uh, we won't be using this vaporizer again. The doctors finally proceed with Christina's surgery. Her father folds a new set of clothes along with a small child's mirror so she'll be able to see her new face. People back in the States have donated all these clothes for the children who are here in Pacapa, and we like to give each child that's having surgery, after their surgery, we like to send them home in a new outfit. But even as Christina's surgery begins, Walter's fever continues to rise. He's the next child up for surgery. The son has a fever. Su hijo tiene fiebre alta. Ah, sí? Sí. Salí de ahí de... I am nervous now. The nurse told me they're not going to do the operation because my son has a fever. Somebody just told me that he had a high fever, so we took his temperature and he does. He has 39, which is well over 100 degrees, and um, we're going to see what happens. Just ask Dr. Sargent, and uh, he may have to check him out. I don't know. The doctors successfully complete Christina's surgery, but must tell Walter no for now. I think if we can, we like to put a surgery off. Maybe Wednesday or Thursday. Um, but I'm concerned that if we tell him no, that he may not come back. So we need to really talk to his father and make sure he really can, can come back. This is a problem. The trip from Harinas to this hospital is a long way, and I don't have money to go back and forth. Does Walter know? Walter, entiendes que por su fiebre por estar tan mal de, de salud, no vamos a operar hoy día, pero más tarde. Vamos a darle un poco de uh, um, antibiótico para quitar su fiebre. ¿Me entiendes? Sí. Muy bien. Muy bien. He understands. Between the fever and the equipment failure, the level of frustration has reached its peak. The team is falling behind schedule. It was really tense there for a while because it seemed like everything was going wrong at the same time. The suction machine wasn't working, the headlight wasn't working, the anesthesia machine wasn't working, so it was just, it was pretty tense. Then, fate deals Dr. Sargent and his team another blow. Oh, no. oh it's light. <laughs> the power the fails. Light. Now bring that flashlight around over here. Let's put it in a sterile glove so someone can hold it. The power returns after they operate in the dark for two hours. Now exhaustion has replaced the frustration. But finally, there is good news. Angelo is waking up from the anesthetic. Christina's arms are fastened to the bed so she won't touch her face. The children just really um, tear me up sometimes when they look so bad. But when they come out of there looking so much better, it's, it's such a joy that I can't really explain it. Like one father said, I don't have the words to thank the doctor. And I don't have the words either, but um, I love it. I love it. 
Muchas gracias, doctor. A usted le agradezco. Porque yo no tenía economía. Me ha faltado dinero, por eso no le... De pequeño no le he hecho para nada. Les agradezco bastante a usted, doctor. Reunions can never happen enough times on a day like this one. Well, we wish you well. Beautiful recovery room now with uh, people there that look so good. And uh, such hope, just uh, run a gamut of feelings. This has been a day where I felt like I've lived a week. After we do their operations, we watch them in the recovery area an hour or two, and then we discharge them home. And that's something that uh, would be surprising in the United States. Here, it's almost expected. Their pain tolerance seems to be much higher. And I think it probably has to do with their way of life. Everyday life here is associated with a certain amount of pain. And so the pain of an operation is not that different from their everyday life. Walter and his father return several days later. Ask him how he feels. Sientes mejor, peor, igual. Feels okay. Dolor de cabeza. Do you want to get your lip fixed today? Quieres reparado tu labio hoy día? Sí. All right. Padre de Walter. Para despedirte, ¿ya? Un abracito. No tengas miedo. Ya, vamos a la sala de operación, ¿ok? Muy bien, doctor. Muy bien. Ya, diga. Chao, papi. Hasta luego. Hasta luego, ¿ya? Ya. Mira tu papá. Ya. Me siento alegre. We've completed the rotation advanced repair of the left unilateral cleft lip. What we've accomplished is to rotate the nostril in to give him symmetry with the opposite nostril. We've put the scar in the area of the filtral ridge. We've evened up the vermilion, so I'm real happy with the symmetry of this uh, repair. I think he's going to be happy as well. We want him to have a look at himself, have his new lab. Walter has waited his entire life for this moment. He's almost too scared to look. His surgery marks the halfway point for the team's week-long stay in Pucallpa. But even now, more children are reaching the clinic. Today I feel a little bit numb. Uh, we're into a system, we're on a roll. My feet are hurting terribly, but uh, we're going real well. We're doing real well, getting in more patients than we had, had expected and hoped. Well, when you operate approximately 10 to 12 hours a day for several days in a row, it, it uh, starts getting to you in terms of the fatigue. Um, but I think that uh, everybody's holding up actually real well. and. There's not a lot of nightlife in Bacalpa, so we go home, go to bed, and are able to start early in the next morning. Essentially, she would need an operation that's done intracranially. Uh, we would have to do that in the United States. To the Tennessee Craniofacial Center, where this team was assembled, also has a foundation that pays for children with the most severe cases to come to the United States. Distance, the bony distance for the ASOX is way too far apart. These children need much more than a cleft lip or palate repaired. What we have to offer is priceless. You can't put a dollar sign on this, and uh, it's misleading to even uh, quote a price on that, but it's uh, a number of operations that uh, in the United States would be extremely expensive. The doctors have operated on 29 children by the time their week in Pucallpa is over. In three months, this is how the children will have changed. Angelo. Walter.
Christina. But Dr. Sargent will never see these scenes. You'll always wonder about those he helped. Here is a country that has people that are very friendly, they're happy, yet they have so little. And you become aware that it's not so much the material things that make you happy, it's having people that love you, that you love. And coming on this trip makes me realize that. The airport is Dr. Sargent's first chance to think about how his life has changed this week. But just minutes before he boards the plane home. I received a note in the airport in Pacalpa requesting that I evaluate two children. Dr. Sargent doesn't yet realize that this small piece of paper is the beginning of an even greater challenge than he faced in Pucallpa. A challenge that he must decide whether or not to accept during the one hour plane ride to Lima. The telegram he received before boarding his plane home was an urgent plea to extend his layover in Lima for just one day. One day to see if he can help two more children. One was an infant. This is the first one we're going to see. Approximately a year old that uh, supposedly has a nasal encephalocele, which is a herniation of the brain through a defect in the facial bones. Shades of dust have replaced the lush green he came to expect in the Amazon basin, but the poverty is just as big a part of this landscape. You think you, you've seen poverty until you've been to a country like this where there is just indescribable, the conditions that some people live in, and the problems that we have back in the U.S. don't seem so big anymore. Uh, they seem almost trivial. These conditions cause more than a thousand children to die each week in Peru. Perlinda Hernandez is in a desperate battle to keep her son, Saul, from becoming one of them. My son has had three operations on his little head, and he suffers a lot every day. We all suffer a lot. There's no hope for us. In what is a very rare occurrence, one of the world's top cranial facial surgeons makes a house call. Hello, it's Dr. Surgeon. Doctors in Lima removed a herniation on Saul's skull when he was 11 months old. It's called an encephalocele. The brain pushes through the front of the skull. The eyes are pushed apart and the center of the face becomes deformed. It's only going to get worse as he gets older. Dr. Sargent's quiet nature hides his alarm. He's discovered something else. The opening in Saul's forehead left from the surgery has never healed. Just the opposite. It's badly infected. I'm concerned about the open wound that he has here. If this should uh, break open, he has uh, dura exposed, and he would get meningitis and could die from that. The second child who hopes to see Dr. Sargent lives hundreds of miles away and has been traveling for hours. Lizeth Keo and her mother are racing to Lima, hoping to find the American doctor before he leaves. Somehow, she must convince him. Not that her deformity is bad enough to deserve his attention. Just the opposite. Her deformity is so severe that she's been rejected by every doctor she's seen. Perhaps, after a lifetime of disappointment, that will change. When she was younger, she would take her dolls and look into the mirror at her bandaged face. Then she would put a bandage on the doll, and the two would look in the mirror together. I think she was asking herself why she was like that and the doll wasn't, just like she compared herself with her friends. 
very few people have ever seen her deformity. It hasn't stopped her from growing up with a remarkable personality. This year, her schoolmates named her Homecoming Queen. But this young woman's triumph over her condition hasn't lessened her hopes for a normal face. It's becoming clear that there are only two possible outcomes for Saul. Either he receives a highly specialized surgery or he will die. That realization is already visible in his mother's eyes. I love my little son very much. I adore him. I would give my life for him. He has suffered more than any have to. There is no one within a thousand miles who can perform the craniofacial surgery Saul needs. There's no way for Dr. Sargent to do it with the facilities in Lima. There is only one solution. Bring Saul to the United States. Several hours later, Lizeth and her mother find Dr. Sargent and his wife Brenda at a mission in Lima. Can we take her bandage off so we can have a look? Okay. Well, Seth has a, uh, a really an overwhelming facial deformity, and I think you can be almost uh, set back by the severity of the deformity. The major procedures necessary to rebuild Lizeth's face would push the art of craniofacial surgery to its limits. In this part, there's really no cheekbone. There's no really bony support over here. The soft tissue just sort of falls in. For Dr. Sargent, it is the ultimate challenge. When I look at someone that has those problems, I look at each particular area and try to think what are the things that I can do that craniofacial surgery can do to help restore those. I think you could do soft tissue work here. But you really don't want to do that. But you couldn't do any major bony reconstruction. Like a huddled meeting that. takes place in the mission's kitchen. I think that we could uh, do a lot to help her. But I think it would be a, a, a longer term commitment than we've been used to doing. Instead of a one stage operation, this is a multi stage reconstruction done over probably several years. I think, I think. We need to try. If we tried, she might have a better life. Are you willing to do it? I think the mother has to realize that there are limitations okay. and that while we hope to make dramatic improvements in her appearance, that she's never going to look totally normal on that side. And it's yeah. never going to look like the other side. I'm willing to do it. It's just a matter of whether we can convince the hospital. If I didn't do it, I'm not sure who who would do it. Uh, she's been turned down a number of times, and it's understandable why she's turned down. This is an extremely difficult problem that takes a number of procedures to try to help her. And hopefully they'll all be successful, but you can't guarantee that. And I'm sure that other people have looked at her and said, it's just too long and involved and it takes too much commitment and they weren't willing to, to give it that uh, commitment and effort. And uh, so I think, if not us, who will it be? The decision is made. Dr. Sargent will perform the surgery Lizeth needs, but not right away. First, he must deal with a life or death situation that could play itself out in a matter of weeks. Saul. We could really help him, and so we made the decision to bring him back to Tennessee, where we would do that operation in our center. Belinda has made her way to downtown Lima. 
flying in an airplane is a concept so foreign to her that she's come to one of the aging cathedrals to pray for their safety. She leaves not knowing what to expect or what will be left of her life when she returns. But as frightening as it must be, she knows it's the only way she can save her son. Linda leaves behind her husband, two children, and very little else. Her Linda and Saul soon cross into uncharted waters. Chattanooga, Tennessee will be their home for the next five months. She doesn't even know where America is. Yesterday she was asking me, is this above Peru or below Peru? So I showed her where Tennessee was and she just has no concept of, of where she is even. Her Linda is 29 years old, but conveniences like an elevator are totally new to her. The ride up is an adventure that lifts her spirits only a little. She's a mother, worried about saving her child. The doctors in Peru didn't explain anything to me, what was wrong with my son or what they would do to help him. But here, the hospital is wonderful. They explain everything to me, what my son's condition is and what they are going to do for him. There's a room available for you upstairs. Okay. It is at the Tennessee Craniofacial Center at Erlanger Medical Center and T.C. Thompson Children's Hospital that baby Saul will undergo a battery of examinations and tests during the week before surgery. One of the first is a CT scan. A ring of detectors inside this device pick up x-rays that pass through the patient's head. The information is fed into a computer to create a three-dimensional image. It reveals much more damage than first expected. Essentially, we have a large defect that extends up through here where there's no bone. This is where the encephalocele came through. As a result of the pushing or the herniation of that encephalocele or mass through the facial skeleton, it's caused some displacement of his bony orbits. And you can see that this orbit has been displaced laterally. It's actually pushed to the side. We have a soft tissue reconstruction of the face that's also generated from the data obtained with a CT scan. And this can actually be overlaid onto the facial skeleton to see exactly what's behind the abnormal contour. And you can see the open wound that Saul has is right where this large missing bone is. There's a great deal of planning that goes into a complicated reconstruction such as Saul's, and that involves not only the physical exam, but a detailed photographic analysis, and now we have the capabilities of actually creating a three-dimensional model of Saul's deformity. Specialized equipment at ProtoMed in Arvada, Colorado uses information from the CT scan to create a life-size model of Saul's skull. A computer-guided laser draws cross-sections of the anatomy in photocurable resin. The beam of light hardens incremental layers of the polymer with pinpoint precision. The finished model is an exact replica of the damaged skull. In the days before the operation, Dr. Sargent uses the model of Saul's skull to plan out the surgery. So we can sit down and plan this operation, design the cuts that I want to make, how much things are going to need to be moved, and precisely outline the exact steps I want to take to repair this deformity. Planning to the last detail is what determines the type of results you're going to get. But it's not just missing bone that's threatening the life of this Peruvian baby. Baby Saul has, uh, has a rather fascinating uh, 
clinical problem. Dr. Tim Strait will be the neurosurgeon during the operation. He has two major problems. There's a problem with a condition called hydrocephalus, or water on the brain. The other problem is he was born with literally a hole through his skull, and the force of the hydrocephalus has literally propelled the brain through that defect. And over time, that has uh, created an abnormal shaped head, and it's given him the deformity of his eyes being too far apart. <laughs> Watch him there. Yeah. Is he he top heavy there. Right now, from his examination, he can hold his head up, but he can't sit up on his own, and he's 15 months old, and generally that function is achieved when they're about six months of age. The medical team has devised a four-part surgery to save Saul. First, Dr. Strait will reduce the hydrocephalus by implanting a shunt in the back of Saul's head and running it into his abdomen. It will allow the fluid on Saul's brain to drain away harmlessly. Dr. Sargent will then reposition the eye sockets. The next step is to replace the missing sections of Saul's forehead with bone harvested from other areas. Finally, Dr. Sargent will reconstruct Saul's nose and close the open wound on his face. The first glimpse of the new Saul comes as Dr. Sargent works and reworks the plan on computer. The amazing thing about this technology is that we can make the actual changes that we propose at the time of the operation and see the results that we're anticipating. Software allows him to choose the nose or eye of a patient, then reshape it. Berlinda cherishes the final hours before surgery with her son. This is the last time she will ever see him like this. She knows what the computer image looks like, but still she wonders. It hurts me to see my son at night. Only at night I can forget a little. But in daytime, when I take care of him, I can't. Thank goodness they are helping us now. <laughs> this is this free floating segment that's got up here that's not connected. Mm -hmm. It's not very good bone. How are you going to position him? Uh, I'm just going to try to turn his head. This. Oh, okay. Don't take care of him. We'll take good care. Uh, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Good mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll put it on the Are they bringing it in? flip this. Uh, these segments of the roof up. Surgery begins at 7.30. Positioning Saul on the table and placing all the intravenous catheters and monitors takes almost an hour. Then comes the task of reducing the fluid on his brain. This is the valve. The tubing down here is ready to go into his belly. Dr. Strait's suspicions are confirmed. Without the shunt, Saul will suffer permanent brain damage about 200 centimeters of water. Normally it should be below 170. Once the shunt is in place, the pressure drops dramatically. But the team knows this is only the first step in a very long, complex operation. In doing these operations, you run into things that weren't expected, that can turn a routine situation into a life-threatening situation, such as rapid blood loss. Doctors make the first incision two hours into the operation. It's the start of a fundamental technique of craniofacial surgery, peeling back the face to reshape the bone beneath. 
This provides us exposure to an entire frontal part of the skull, particularly the forehead area. We then can dissect further down onto the face, dissecting out each eyeball and down onto the nose. This is the dura over the brain. It's exposed. It's exactly like the model, so that's a big help. But the gaps need to be filled in. We've got limited places where we can take the bone. We don't want to leave too large an area without bone, so we have to design this so it's the best way to obtain as much grafts as possible. Dr. Sargent will take strips of bone from the back of the skull to reshape the forehead. I've made a template and we'll use that to restore the contour and the top part of the orbit. We've harvested a couple of bone grafts. We took a The reconstruction of, process takes another, another four hours. My next goal would be to move soul's eye sockets close together. The right eye socket is much larger than the left eye socket. After the eyes are repositioned, Dr. Sargent begins to reshape the forehead. After I've harvested my bone graft from the back part of the skull, I then contour it to the appropriate shape and place it on the brow. This is a microplating system, and the screws are made of titanium. So you can see how stable that is. The new bone must not only fit in place, it must stay in place until Saul's bones heal. We have wires in the corners of the eyes to pull those closer together. Once we get all the bone grafts in place, we'll tighten them down to get the soft tissue to contour appropriately. So we've got a little ways to go. Saul is missing a large area of the bone directly behind your nose. To reconstruct that, we've taken some bone from the back part of his skull, cut those into strips, and then secured them together with a tiny screw. The harvested bone will become Saul's new nasal bones after several months. Screws eight, that to eight. For the past seven hours, surgery has gone smoothly, but there are another two hours to go. When you have a very lengthy operation, it increases the risk when you're dealing with a small child. You have to worry about whether they become hypothermic or their temperature drops too low because you've had their brain and skull area exposed for a long number of hours. These are all considerations that have to be carefully watched. Hi, Olivia. This is Denise. I just want to let you know that Saul's doing fine. We're still in here, but everything's going great. Tell Mama that he's doing terrific. We are going to be in here a little bit longer, and we'll just keep calling back. Muy bien, la todo sigue adelante. Puede ser que una hora, dos horas más. Saul's case was complicated by the fact that he had a chronic open wound in the forehead area. We were hoping that we would just be able to excise that. However, in exposing his forehead, we ran into multiple pockets of infection. During this entire day, Dr. Sargent has taken no breaks so that he can remain focused on the surgery. He stays on his feet the entire time. These are very complex, lengthy operations that require a great deal of concentration and focus. Nine hours after it began, surgery is complete. Well, you can see what we've accomplished. We excised area where there was an ulceration which uh, was uh, right beneath the dura uh, and then we've taken out this area of abnormal skin this hair bearing uh, we brought the corner of the eyes together we brought the orbits together uh, gave more projection to the brow better contour to the forehead uh, and significantly narrowed and shortened the appearance of the nose Saul is taken to a pediatric intensive care unit. You're only half the way home once you've completed the operation. He still has to recover from the anesthesia, from the blood loss that he has sustained. There are all number of problems that can happen very suddenly that can turn a child that's doing extremely well into one that's in a life-threatening situation. It is the end of a very intense day for Dr. Sargent.
Everything went real, real well. Oh, Turned out morning. real good. He's doing real well. He looks beautiful to me. I can't wait to take him home to Peru so his daddy and brother and sister can see him. This is unbelievable. It's a miracle. I'm so happy. My son will live now. <laughs> the test in the coming weeks will be whether or not Saul can sit upright and his motor skills improve. Five months have passed since Saul received surgery. I love my little son so much. He looks normal now. He's much healthier. I'm so excited every moment I spend with him. I love to watch him play and pick things up. Every day he gets better and better. He even took a baby step. He's starting to walk. I've been given so many blessings. He's made a dramatic improvement in his motor skills. When he arrived, he was probably at the level of a three month old. Now he's uh, even gotten to the point where he's taking steps. So, I mean, that's just an amazing amount of improvement in a very short period of time. Belinda and Saul will soon make their way back to family in Peru. As that day nears, Dr. Sargent's thoughts wander back to his journey there. I think the satisfaction and the personal rewards I get from doing it that have helped a lot of people that wouldn't otherwise have been helped, that makes it all worthwhile and, and I'll very happily go back and will go back. He may have left Peru but a part of him remains in the face of every child he touched, in their smiles, their eyes, and in their hearts. In the constant stream of new cases, new challenges, the doctor may forget, but the children and their parents will never forget. Dr. Sargent has changed them forever by bestowing that most simple and precious of gifts, a second chance. I'm going to go on with my schooling so I can be a doctor when I grow up. Then I can help other people. Now, at the end of his journey to help these faces in the forest, he's discovered that they have led him to the beginning of an even greater journey, one that will now take him to the limits of craniofacial surgery. Lizette. There are always new challenges out there. <laughs> <laughs>